National Seafood Program Manager at the Gulf of Maine Research yeah, Institute, which is based in Portland, down in Portland, but yeah. we're really a or, uh, regional organization um, and do work all over the Gulf of Maine region, which stretches from Halifax, Nova Scotia, all the way down to Cape Cod. I'll introduce myself too, and then if there are other people that are going to do introductions, I'll hand it over to you guys. Um, so my name's uh, Brianna Jackson. I am the farm to school coordinator for the city of Chicopee, Massachusetts. And we've been partnering with the GMRI um, C to school program. And we're really excited about fish over here. So um, really happy to be here today on this very snowy day and to hear about all your beautiful main towns. <laughs> always so there's always like cliffs and bluffs and like beautiful ocean views and here it's just like woods and snow <laughs> um i can go next i'm susan alcott i work for maine coast fishermen's association and um got looped into this call through our fishermen feeding mainers um fish donation program and that's where we have donated um, fillets of a variety of ground fish species to schools and food banks throughout Maine um, in partnership with the DOE. So happy to share any more information about that with, um, with anyone on this call, either now or afterwards, you can follow up with me. I don't think I see Carol in the uh, list as of yet. She hasn't checked in or am I missing her on the screen? If I don't see Carol, um, maybe we could jump to um, Katie with Maine Department of Education. Katie Knowles. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Katie. Um, yep, like you said, I'm with the Maine Department of Education. Um, I'm their new farm and seed to school coordinator. Um, so yeah, this is my third week on the job, and um, I thought that this would be a wonderful meeting to attend, um, as I am the Farm and Seed to School Coordinator, so, and I'm just very excited um, to hear what's going on. Um, but yeah, I manage the DOE's um, numerous Farm to School programs. So. Great. Thank you. And Chris, do you want to jump in next? Sure. I'm Chris Greenier. I'm a retired school nutrition director and working as a consultant with Full Plates Full Potential. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and again, I don't think I see Carol here. If we want to just do a quick introduction from the nutrition directors that are here, I think we've covered all the uh, partners. And if I miss someone, please jump in. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Sear, and I'm the food service director at Blue Hill School in Blue Hill, Maine. Thank you. Um, I can go next. I'm Heather Witten. I'm the food service director at um, Setamoja for RSU 68. So I have pre-K through eighth grade. And I'll probably have my camera off for a little bit of time because as most of you know, this is lunchtime. So the food service, this is this is now when we get to eat after lunch is over. So um, so you don't have to watch me chew. I'll probably have my camera off part of the time. All good. <laughs> Welcome, Heather. Go ahead, Greg. Hi. Yes, I'm Greg Berry. I'm the food service director here for Ellsworth Schools. This is my second year. And I saw this email come across and very intrigued about um, this. So looking forward to seeing the presentation. Thanks, Greg. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing everybody on the screen. Feel free to jump right in next. I'll go next. I uh, do have my camera off. I'm Melinda. I am the food service director for RSU 24. Uh, so we have five schools kind of spread out through down East Maine from Eastbrook down to Steuben. Great. Thanks, Melinda. Hi, I'm Trisha Dyer, not a food service director. I'm the manager of Ellsworth High School Kitchen and needing to get extra hours of training and thought this would be interesting to listen in on. Great. Thanks, Trisha. I'll go next. 
I'm Noelle Scott. I'm the food service director of the Bangor School Department. We saw this come across and thought it would be interesting to attend. Welcome, Noelle. And I think we're missing um, Mia. Yes, I'm Mia Shred. I'm the food services coordinator uh, for Millinocket School Department. We have two schools, uh, grammar school and a middle school, high school. And it'd be nice to introduce some varieties and fish, you know, beyond our fish sticks that we offer every now and again. Um, so that's why I'm here today. Super. And uh, we are, I think that covers all nutrition and cafeteria staff, I believe. Uh, that leaves uh, Kate, myself, and Deb. We're all HEAL coordinators supporting through Maine Preventative Network and Obesity Prevention. And um, I think from here, Kate and Deb, do you have anything else to do? We'll go right into our presenters. That sounds, sounds great, great, Sandy. All right. And I still did not see Carol. If she jumps in, I'll add her in. Good to go, ladies. Um. Bree and I are very coordinated in that we didn't talk at all <laughs> before this. Um, so Bree, if it's okay with you, I will go ahead and share um, sort of the nuts and bolts of the program, and then I'll let you dive in with your on the ground expertise. Yeah, that's how I Does that sound telepathically good? assumed cool. that this we're would on go. The same, we're so on the same page. That's, that's what my notes look like. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I just want to, first of all, thank everyone for tuning in. This is work that I'm really excited about. And I'm so pleased to have so many food service professionals, our school lunch heroes in the audience, um, <clears throat> because really you're the ones doing the work, making it happen. You literally feed our children every day. You're overworked and underpaid and undervalued. So um, I hope that this, um, I don't know, helps you feel proud of all the incredible work that you do. Um, so um, before I dive in, I just will tell you a little bit about myself and let's see if my slides advance. And I'm assuming that everybody can see because nobody said anything otherwise. Um, Things are good. Okay, here we go. Um, so I grew up in mid coast Maine. I come from a family of fishermen. My dad's been an urchin diver for the past, you know, 35 years. And it's not just my dad who's a fisherman, it's my aunties and uncles and brothers and cousins. Really, everyone in my family has been involved in the seafood industry one way or the other. I myself worked on an oyster farm and I've been third man for my uncles on their lobster boat. So it makes a lot of sense that I ended up here at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute where we develop and deliver collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. And more specifically on the seafood team, we really work to get more local seafood out into the marketplace for a variety of reasons. But really we want to see you know, our wonderful coastal communities being resilient and harvesting a diversity of seafood. Um, so what's great for us in this mission is that the Gulf of Maine is really home to an abundance of seafood. Um, so if that's, you know, true, why do I have a job from trying to get more people to eat more local seafood? And it's really because our seafood in this region competes in a massive global marketplace. Um, I'm going to throw it out. Anybody who wants to unmute, does anybody want to take a guess as to how much seafood in this country that we eat is imported? Don't be shy. Oh, go ahead, Kate. I had to say 40%. 40%, um, it's actually between 70 and 90%. Um, and, you know, in Maine, yes, our shellfish and our lobsters are definitely here. But even when it comes to our ground fish, which, you know, is what New England is known for, you go up and down the coast and you get fish and chips, you just assume that that fish is going to be coming from our local waters. But in fact, it's most likely coming from places like Norway or Iceland and pre-Ukraine Russia. Um, so 
um, we want to get more people to eat more of our local seafood um, and build demand and value for local seafood. And we do that by working with seafood businesses up and down the supply chain. So we work with restaurants, we work with universities, hospital dining, business dining, and um, more recently, and what I'm we're finally doing is that we're working with K-12 schools. Um, so um, we really believe that seafood is an important solution for all of these really big things that are impacting our day-to-day, -day. you know, chronic disease, impacts to our health, everything that's going on with our environment, and also what's happening in our local and regional economies as well. Um, so I'm just gonna touch on these three things really quickly. Um, and first and foremost, and it really makes a difference in schools, like seafood is so good for you. Look at these facts. I mean, the first one always floors me is that like, if you eat the recommended two servings of fish a week or seafood a week, you can cut your risk of dying by heart disease by over a third. Um, and the dean of the nutrition school at Tufts down in Boston has a famous saying. He always says that there are three things that you can do to live a long and healthy life. And that's to don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, and eat seafood. Um, and, you know, that's the case for everybody, but it's also the case for students. I mean, I grew up getting free lunch. I know how important it is for students to have a healthy and nutritious meal and getting fish on cafeteria trays is a win, 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 win. Students are going to benefit so much. It's good for their brains, their bones, their hearts. I could go on and on and on. Inevitably, when we talk about all these wonderful benefits, everybody's like, well, wait a second, what about mercury? Um, and as you can see on this slide, um, for the major foods that we, seafoods that we eat in this country, you'd have to eat a lot um, to have any sort of risk from mercury. So uh, you'd, have, excuse me, have to eat 10 pounds of canned tuna a week or like 100 pounds of shrimp, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then also in terms of our local fish here, from the FDA, we have best choices, good choices, and choices to avoid. And I've highlighted the fish here that are going to be coming from our local waters. And all of them, except for monkfish, are in the best choices, and monkfish is in the good choices. So you can feel really good about eating local fish. Um, we also know that seafood can be environmentally responsible. Um, you know, in the past we've had overfishing, but due to really good regulations and management put in place by the federal and state government, a lot of our fish have rebuilt in this region. And we have a really abundance of responsibly harvested seafood that we can be eating. We also know that seafood is a climate friendly choice. And this is more and more important for all of these wonderful, like, Gen Z and Gen Alphas that are coming up who do care more about the climate impacts of what they're eating. So this is another way just to present seafood as this wonderful thing. So amazing. Um, it's just the economic and community benefits that it has in New England and especially here in Maine. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so it helps that we have really two profitable seafood items in New England. So obviously here in Maine, lobster is a big one and scallops are um, bringing a lot of income to New England as well. Um, so you can see the values up here. It's like seven over $700 million and $500 million, which is over the agricultural product value. Um, but when we talk about white fish, you know, we're not nearly bringing in as much money as we have before. And so um, this isn't because the fish is, isn't here anymore. And it's not because we're not eating them. Um, it's a really complicated answer to like why that's not happening, but a lot has to do with demand. So what you see here on this graph is the quota. So the, the 
sh darker shaded part of the fish is the percent of quota that we're harvesting for these species here. And so quota, just as like a reminder, is the amount of fish that we're allowed to take out of the ocean that is like the sustainable level that's set by, you know, our fishery management council. Um, so for all of these species, we're taking under half of what we're allowed. Um, so we're really leaving money in the water. And so if we were to do a back of that napkin calculation um, and say we're getting a buck a pound for each of these, then we're getting up into a much higher amount of money that could be coming back into our local economies if we were harvesting more of our wonderful local fish, which means we need to have more people eating our wonderful local fish. Um, and just as a reminder, when you talk about local fish and when you talk about that $250 million that I showed, that's just what's going back to the boat. And there's so many businesses that support and are supported by so if you, know, you got fuel, you got gear, you got your bait. When you talk about bait, you get this, I can't see my thing anymore, but you get this whole thing again. Um, you can talk about the dockside businesses, the processing plants, broadline distributors. There are fish markets. I can't see what I'm sh sharing. So I just need to like move this out to the side so I can talk. Grocery stores, um, you know, you can talk about value added, you know, waste stream products. And ultimately it ends up in front of the consumers at home or at our schools or businesses or universities. And when we talk about local seafood, there are people behind every single one of these. And um, with local seafood, these people are your friends, they're your neighbor, they're your family. So you're really making a huge impact on your community and your local economy as well. So, um, and I want to be cognizant of my time. So um, sorry if I just speed through the last of these. Um, so we want to build demand for local fish by doing, working with schools for all of these wonderful reasons that I just shared. Um, and it, as I said before, it can make a huge impact in schools. Um, and you can see the stat here that most schools across New England aren't serving seafood. Um, and I looked at the most recent um, farm to school census from 2019. And of the 518 schools from New England that um, participated in the survey, only nine of them had seafood in one of their top three purchases. So really we don't have enough schools serving local seafood. Um, so we've been really fortunate to receive a number of grants, both a USDA Farm to School grant and currently a Kendall Food Vision Prize to work to try and get more local seafood into schools. Um, and, you know, we often hear that we don't want it from food service staff and directors. We don't want to serve seafood because um, it's difficult to prepare. Kids don't like it. And it's really hard to procure. Um, so to answer the first one of those, fish is really no more difficult to prepare than any other raw protein. Um, and Bree will be able to talk to this more as our expert you know, food person, food service person here. Um, and actually we've had the pleasure of working with Chef Sam Cohen Skizbaro over the past couple of years. And she developed five new recipes that are really, really simple. You know, Mike Flynn down in RSU 12 is the Sea to School champion. And he and his um, partner, Vicki Dill can get through a hundred pounds of fish in 30 minutes. And they're like cutting it, weighing it, prepping it, putting it on trays to go in the freezer. Not everybody can do this. And so Sam's created these recipes where it's really simple. You just throw a filet of fish into a pan and then you mix all of these recipes. So it really can't be any easier. Um, and so this is an example of this. Um, part of this project that we're working on is developing some culturally diverse recipes because South Portland and Westbrook both have large population of New Mainer and immigrant students who are coming from places in the world where they eat way more seafood than Americans do. Uh, so we're offering them a familiar protein with a familiar preparation. 
And these recipes are intentionally designed to be super simple and straightforward. So I also mentioned that we hear um, from food service professionals that, you know, they don't want to serve fish because kids don't like fish. And that's inevitably not true. Um, and we've done numerous taste tests to back this up. Um, you can see some of the percentages here. And, you know, this is true across you know, New England and all age groups. Inevitably, if you have a three point scale, it's between like 70 and 90% of kids who are in that top I like it range. Um, and really my, what, what I believe is that when adults say kids don't like fish, they're really saying that they don't like fish. Um, and that makes a difference, right? Because students look up to school lunch heroes and we've seen across the school district, maybe at one school, they have food service staff who are really excited and engaged around serving local seafood. You can see Annalise Johnson, who is at Carroll School up in Northern Vermont made fish melons, you know, like just really excited and engaged. So at that school, they'll have really high meal participation numbers when maybe another school on the other side of the, the town has food service staff who don't wanna be serving fish and maybe are grumpy about it because you know, it smells or I don't like it or for whatever reason, which is fair. Like everybody can have their opinions, but let's not, you know, influence students because this can make such a huge difference on everything, their health, it's so wonderful. So um, we see that at schools where the staff is engaged, they always have greater meal participation than another school at the same district who is staff that is less excited and engaged. Um, again, like gone are the days of like the Calvin and Hobbes lunch lady. Like we have school lunch heroes and students really look up to our school lunch heroes. So um, this was my favorite thing I think that I've ever done in my job. Um, I was doing literal cartwheels in the parking lot afterwards is we held a training for food service staff, um, not only on like the how of working with fish. So working, showing these recipes that Chef Sam created, but also the why behind it. So sort of a, a longer version of everything that I just word vomited at you. And um, what we found with pre and post surveys um, is that these trainings really influence the confidence level of these food service professionals and their sort of belief in their ability to um, serve local fish. So I love this slide. I love these graphs and it just makes me really, really happy. So I hope we, we just applied for a USDA Farm to School grant um, where we hope to replicate these trainings around the region. So cross your fingers for us. We'll be up in Northern Maine if that happens. Um, but we've seen that it really makes a difference. Um, so what I can say to all of you wonderful food service professionals and school lunch heroes is that kids look up to you. So really model eating and loving seafood be in enthusiastic, be encouraging, and be supportive. Um, and I think, oh, here are just some like fun numbers um, from our USDA project, but I will leave it there and stop my share. And I hope I what didn't like hog too much of the airtime. Oh, that was great, Sophie. Um, and I just wanted to introduce everyone. Uh, Carol did show up as well, so she can be part of our uh, conversation. And um, I think... Uh, we probably want to try and hold questions um, to the end. You can add them into the chat so we can monitor them and add them to the um, end. And Carol, if you could just introduce yourself real quick to this uh, crew so they know who you are, and then you and Brianna can uh, continue on the conversation. Great. Right. My name is Carol Kent, and I'm the School Nutrition Director for Lamoille North School District. We are way up in northeastern or northwestern Vermont. Um, a district of 1800 students. We have um, six buildings. We're very rural um, and all of our schools are CEP. So um, yeah, we have, we're pretty landlocked. We don't have a lot of fresh fish available. So if we can make this work, I think anybody can make it work. <laughs> nice. Um, 
Super. Thank you for joining us, Carol. And uh, Brianna, do you want to continue the conversation and you and Carol could kind of um, tag team on what these nutrition directors and cafeteria staff really want to hear about? Yeah. So I'll, um, I can speak from, I work in food service, but I am not a food service director. So I'll kind of give what I see and then Carol can kind of show everything that she's done. Um, so in Chicopee, Massachusetts, we're on the Western side of the state and our district has about 6,800 students. Um, and we're also CEP and there's 15 different schools. Um, so I started in June 2022 as the farm to school coordinator um I came into this with just a background of being kind of obsessed with fish um so my father is um like a very amateur fisherman he's got this little hand line and he stands in the ocean um on the south shore of Massachusetts and he catches like enormous striped bass and so I just grew up having access to like amazing fresh fish that my dad had just like literally pulled out of the water and dragged up on the beach and like got like throngs of people being like what the heck how did this guy do this with this like little sometimes he got a nicer hand line but it started off as just like a chunk of wood um so we're I come from a scrappy people that like fish um and so when thinking about like I have a nutrition background um and thinking about fish in schools it seemed like a no-brainer because I know how like good it is from a nutrition standpoint and also when thinking of farm to schools because we're so inland we don't have the farm to sea to school is not really farm and sea to school isn't really in our lexicon yet we're still trying to build out what like sea to school looks like if we're not you know like right on the shore and we don't have like that same connection to um, local fishermen so I'm doing my my best to promote that in my work um, but we have been doing farm to school work in Chicopee for at least the last 10 years. Um, and prior to me starting, um, we had already established a relationship with a local um, meat distributor. So we've been able to order um, Red's Best fish sticks from Boston, um, North Coast Buffalo fish nuggets that contain some local fish. And I think we're going to start trying Red's Best, um, their breaded, breaded haddock fillets um, and using those in fish tacos. So just kind of fun ways that you think to prepare fish usually go over well with kids. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um farm to school stuff and kind of how my job works so um for farm to school coordinator type positions within local school districts um I'm the only one that I know um whose position is housed in food service a lot of time this farm to school work is done um with science education so it is, has much more of a like a classroom component um and farm to school a lot of times is like there's a school garden um we do we, we grow vegetables in the school garden we serve them at lunch it's really cool the kids get to see um, different things growing and get to try all different kinds of new foods, but doesn't really expand out to like seafood. And so what kind of role does that play in this work? Um, so right now, in addition to doing like cafeteria taste tests, which I will also talk about, um, we are working on a grant that we received from the USDA. It's Chicopee Public Schools, another um, school district in our area, and the local food bank, and we're working on expanding out agricultural education in our school, um, in our schools, and so we're forming a farm to school committee of teachers and like me, and we're going to come up with some lesson plans from for like all K. I'm hoping like all grade levels um, that can be used as like a bank where you can go and and like, I don't know, teach the kids about local squash, but also like local seafood um, and to make sure that people are thinking of that because just in the conversations that I've had with this other school district and our local food bank, I think that it's really primarily dominated like farm to school, local food, it's, it's vegetables and fruits to some extent um so trying to change that perception is like it's like really deep-seated and it's kind of difficult um outside of these like coastal communities but it's really exciting um because I have been working a lot with students and just trying to get 
like colloquially a vibe check on like what they think about fish. Um, so it just timed it well with this talk. Um, I was um, at a lo- one of our high schools on Friday and we had just ordered an extra case of the Red's Best Fish Sticks. And so um, I had went and ordered some um there was like a local mango not necessarily local but it was a mango salsa that we could get from a grocery vendor and so that was something I didn't have to prepare for this taste test um I could just get like the fish sticks and so I went to one of the high schools and I talked to a bunch of students just like really informally um it can be kind of difficult when it's just it's nice that I have like that my position exists within our food service department, but it can for like learners, um, it can be kind of tough to and if you're trying to do like an activity or like have it be more interactive, it's helpful to have at least two people doing it. Um, but I was able to talk to a bunch of kids and they really do like fish. Um, and a lot of them told me like they really like salmon, which you can't really get locally, but um, that there is just kind of a jumping off point. Like they really like tuna. Like is there way, ways of preparing fish kind of similar to fish that they like um, using more local products that we could um, really kind of entice them with. They also said they really like fish with sauce, which like it kind of sounds like uh, like yes miss we like fish with sauce but like and it sounds like it's kind of like glib or like whatever kind of a short comment but it actually is like a really interesting jumping off point to be like okay like how can we pair fish with something that they really like or you know just something that's going to have it not be dry um I know Carol's going to talk more about her experience um she's she's had a lot of success with uh, getting students exposed to like different kinds of fish and unbreaded fish products, which we are just not really quite there yet. We're definitely like working our way closer to that, but, um, our students are still getting used to the idea of like fish being good. So, um, but, you know, thinking like down the line, something with like, maybe if, even if it's an unbreaded product, we could either like prepare a sauce from scratch or order it from like our grocery vendor, like the salsa that we have um, access to, or even some sort of kind of prepared sauce that you can pair it with um, that makes it more palatable to them and just like easier for them to try. So um, I run these taste tests and they generally go pretty well. Um, We also are, I'm really excited about this like education component because in the cafeteria, I have found that like at smaller schools, you can have a little bit more of like an educational piece to it. But a lot of times just at least in, in Massachusetts, a lot of our lunch periods are like 15 to 20 minutes and it's full level trying to get all of the students like trying to I really wants to sit through an announcement about you know like local fish they kind of just you kind of just go up to them like you want a sample and they're like yeah it's kind of like non a non-verbal exchange a lot of times um so it's I just don't have that same level of like and like let's get into the nuts and bolts about like how good eating seafood is for the economy but I know that that is a really helpful um like way of of getting them interested in it and I've read some studies um I wish I had like the exact source but essentially at the like old younger kids they're more impressionable it's kind of easier for them um to try different stuff but for older students to kind of talk to them like almost like you talk to a peer and kind of explain like the marketing behind a lot of the convenience foods that they get and how you know nobody's going out and like marketing a fresh orange or like marketing Pollock like you don't turn on the TV and that's not being pushed to you and like unless something weird is trending on TikTok you're probably not going to see it there either um and so to to kind of talk with them about like why you know how that works and how you can kind of push back against some of that by eating more local foods um of all different types And so um, I'm really excited for the work we're doing and continuing to partner with Sophie on. Um, Just like a great time. Um, I love fish. And uh, thank you so much for for talking to us and for all the work that you do, even just kind of getting into um, this topic, because 
it definitely feels, I just went to a talk last week about kind of like local meat and seafood. And I think it's kind of starting to get some momentum behind it. And you guys are um, a little bit, have a little bit ahead of the curve in, and really trying to get this amazing nutritious food out to kids. So thank you. Great information, Brianna. Thank you so much. And Carol, do you want to go ahead and piggyback off of that? Sure. Um, first, I want to give a little framework here. I am subbing in one of my elementary schools, very understaffed, so I'm in the kitchens all the time now. Um, so you may also hear drumming coming from the next <laughs> room in the auditorium, cafeteria, gymnasium. <clears throat> so bear with me. Um, and I'll try to get through this before our after school program comes for me. <laughs> um, so I, I, back in like uh, probably 2010, 2012, I was working as a manager in an elementary school um, in Richmond, Vermont. And one of our, <clears throat> we, I ran into a young man who was a, a salmon fisherman in Alaska, but he was from our neighboring town. And we teamed up. And with some fundraising, we were buying uh, Alaskan salmon and did a taste test with our kids, um, elementary kids. And we had a whole eat like a bear day. Um, and the, the teachers ran with it and they did crafts and they were wearing bear hats. And we did a big bulletin board and our fishermen came in with whale bones and his um, equipment that he fishes with. and the kids were just enamored with him. So, and they tasted our salmon fish cakes and they went home begging for salmon. <clears throat> um, that really informed me as to kids liking fish and how you get them to try fish. Um, so fast forward just before COVID, um, I was contacted by Sophie about starting a sea to school program um, with Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and I, I jumped at that chance. Um, I love a project and I love a challenge. And um, the idea of getting fresh, regionally local fish in our schools was really exciting. Uh, currently, we purchase about 25% of our food is local. Um, and we do local beef and local chicken. Um, so being able to offer a regionally local fish was really exciting. The only issue we had with it was trying to get it from the sea to the school. Um, we did not have any distribution for that. Um, we work with PFG and they had zero interest in taking on a new product just for our school district. Um, wasn't able to rally any other districts into getting interested in this. So <clears throat> we ended up um, hooking up with a local seafood shop the next town over and the owner goes down to Boston every Thursday to pick up his fish and Red's Best um, talked with um, Ed Flanagan from Stowe Seafood and asked if he'd be willing to deliver our fish to us. So a couple times a month on Thursdays Ed goes down to Boston he picks up his fish he picks up our fish. This week it was 200 pounds um, and he drives it back and drops it off in our outdoor freezer at our high school. Um, we're paying for his gas, for his deliveries, um, for him to pick it up, which is like 50 bucks delivery for us. Um, the cost of the fish, we're in the catch of the day program. So we're purchasing whatever they have an abundance of that day. Um, and it costs us six fifty a pound, which is about what we're paying for our local beef. Um, so we pair that with some commodities items to keep the plate cost down. And so far, our kids have eaten uh, fluke and hake and skate and pollock and haddock and cod and monkfish. Um, and they do all of that. We we basically use one recipe. And I think there was a photo that Sophie had showed of them preparing fish. We use a butter oil blend <clears throat> and um, we coat the fish with it. And then we put it in a panko 
crumb topping. It's got some Parmesan cheese and herbs in it. And we bake it. And it's foolproof. And the kids love it. They come back for seconds. For, I had a kindergartner who came back and asked for thirds on fish. And we've had kids come back and ask for seconds on that really good chicken. And um, <laughs> we're like, sure. <laughs> This chicken we call fish. Um, so even our sixth graders get really excited about it and they love it. At the high school level, we make fish tacos with um, a really beautiful pineapple salsa and a chipotle lime creme. Mm. Um, we use a um, vinaigrette, vinaigrette dress slaw on top of it. Um, that's a huge hit. They also do like the just baked crispy fish fillets as well. Um, <clears throat> but back when Sophie first started the Sea to School program with me before we got all shut down by COVID, um, she came up, we did some taste testing. My farm to school coordinator at the time was vehemently opposed to fish. She does not like it. So it kind of fell to my managers and myself and Sophie to really sell it. And one of the ways we tied it in with the kids was we talked about whether they ever go fishing up here in Vermont with their families. And turns out a lot of kids, they go fishing in the streams and the ponds and the lake. Um, and so they, they were all excited to be able to say, I know all about fishing. And then we tied it in with fishing on the coast and fishing for these big fish. Um, and that was, that was a real buy-in for them. Uh, likewise, when I wanted to, um, get my staff excited about selling fish to kids. And most of my staff are not big fish eaters. Um, two years ago, I took them on a field trip to Portland. Uh, we worked it out with the team at Green, um, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, I had some money in my budget for some professional development and I took a crew up to Portland. We stayed overnight. We spent the day learning at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and went out on a fishing boat. Um, I took them out to a seafood restaurant. Um, we just had some really great bonding time, but I think here's the thing that clicked with them. When they were talking about the fishing industry and being handed down into families, and how it takes 15 years to get a fishing license, um, my staff, it clicked with them because it was very much like the dairy industries that many of them grew up in, the dairy families, the sugaring families, how it's handed down generation after generation, that clicked with them. And, um, <clears throat> and that made a difference in why we were doing this, what the importance was to the economy and to these families, um, keeping this local. You know, the same reason we're not buying dairy from Alaska or Norway, we're not buying our fish from there either. Um, we're gonna keep it local and, and try to put some money back into our New England economies. Um, so that was huge for them and they were big proponents after that of selling the fish. Uh, we also buy the haddock sticks from Red's Best. Um, so we do fish twice a month. We use do fish sticks and we do the crispy baked fish. Um, so you can do it. You just gotta tie it into what the kids know uh, make them feel invested in it and your staff as well. Um, I'll answer any questions you have. <laughs> yeah, but fantastic. Thank you so much, Carol, for sharing that story. And um, yeah, let's open it up to questions um, from staff that you've got some experts here that have really greased the wheels for you. I'll ask a question. I I don't work in with the schools, but I'm just wondering um, what. So where where do where do we start? Like if we want to start serving some more seafood, additional seafood, or any seafood, like where do we even start here in Maine? Do we call? I, I think that the first step is to talk to your supplier, um, talk to your vendor, um, and ask. 
do you supply local seafood? And actually I put some of these links into the chat, but we have a whole how-to guide to serve local seafood in your district. Um, so that can be a resource. We also have a Sea to School resource hub, which has over 50 recipes for the K through 12 space, which can be a good tool. Um, I'm always a resource. Um, if I mean, I'm sort of on the, we have a decision tree on how to go about getting local seafood. And I'm like the last stop on the list. Um, but I wonder, Susan, if you wanna um, maybe just tell everyone here about the Fisherman Feeding Mainers program. Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, yeah, I was gonna say there are sort of multiple avenues. Um, I like how you laid it out as like the decision tree of, of how you get to the right answer. Um, and I think Sophie's talking more about purchase of fish, whereas our program um, is a fish donation program. So it's something that we coordinate through the DOE and um, Katie, I'm looking forward to meeting you tomorrow to <laughs> talk about streamlining that process to make it easier for schools. Um, and one of these, one of the things that we have run up against, which you mentioned <clears throat> as well is that um, it's hard to figure out um, the delivery mechanism. So we're trying to work on that as well um, with native Maine and get those kinks worked out so that you don't have to pick up the fish in Portland. Um, but to step back a little bit, the program um, has been going for over two years and it started during the pandemic to support the fishermen. And I love all of the discussions about how important that is as well. Um, you know, it's it's about getting the seafood to the students as, as much as it is like supporting the livelihoods and the waterfront businesses and all the infrastructure and everything from the processing to like the ice and the bait and the fuel and the docks and everything. Um, so it really started from our perspective, like not, I mean, we're, we're not a food insecurity organization. So it started to support those businesses. Um, but really grew into this pretty large scale fish donation program where first we donated um, fillets of ground fish to um, food banks through Good Shepherd. And then it started um, to expand to include um, schools. And we also service some community groups as well. So I just put that out there. I think everybody here is in is is part of the education system, but we also like give direct donations to places like Wabanaki Reach and the Somali Bantu organization. So if any of you tangentially are part of organizations like that that would like to get fish donations, um, I put my contact info in the chat, um, and it's very easy. It's just Susan at MainCoastFisherMen dot org. Um, and so right now, the way it works, and I think we're probably going to make this, hopefully, as I said, a little bit easier now that Katie's on board, um, not to put you on the hook, Katie, but <laughs> um, hoping to make it easier for everybody, um, is periodically there's an email that goes out um, to anyone interested that says, like, here's what we have, and you can basically check it off like an order form. I want this many pounds of this species, um, and then at this point, you have to come pick it up. Um, but hopefully, you know, that will, that will shift. And it's all, um, it's filleted and frozen. So it's not, you don't have to handle the whole fish. Um, and there are a lot of great um, resources. Sophie's got a ton on their website. We have a bunch on our website too. We've done some of the trainings um, to educate some staff and do some recipe sharing and filleting, you know, that kind of process and storage. Um, so yeah, I guess I that's that's a that's like a big overview, and um, it's been really fun to be a part of. I think Sophie shares my enthusiasm for like it's just so cool to see kids get excited about this, and like my kids are at the Brunswick Junior High, and they come home, and they're like, "Yeah, we had fish today," and um, you know that's that's pretty neat. So um, it's really impactful, and the stories we get back are really wonderful, and to know that like schools that couldn't afford to purchase local fish can get it for free and can, um, you know, now draw upon the educational resources that GMRI has developed, which is something like we don't have the bandwidth to do. Um, 
completes a nice package that that really elevates the value of local fisheries with like the youngest generations, which is really critical. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Nice. Questions from cafeteria staff and directors would love to hear questions, comments. Curious for staff if you would have interest in training in the future. So if you mentioned potential for up this way, having a training class, that would be amazing. Do you see yourself uh, going further with this possibility of serving more local seafood? I would be interested in doing further training as time allows. As you know. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Melinda. Being someone who works in the kitchen, I agree with Melinda. I think the training would be great, but I also think being able to pick it up up this way and not in Portland is a huge, a huge difference too. Mm -hmm. Definitely a barrier for our region. I can just speak for Seto really quick that we, um, I can honestly say our kids don't like fish because we're a very poor community. So our kids aren't used to eating it at home. Mm -hmm. So we try, but they just, they, they won't eat it. Um, but we try, we still serve lobster rolls like twice a year. And of course it freaks everyone out. They're like, you're serving lobster rolls in a school menu. Yeah, we are. Um, but those same kids that don't eat lobster rolls are also the same kids that don't eat the chicken nuggets we serve. So, um, but I do have to say that Cisco is really good about, um, they serve, are they sell picked, it's already cooked and already picked lobster meat and like the claws and knuckles. Um, so it makes it really convenient. So at least it takes that I don't have time to pick a lobster. That is not an excuse anymore. You can buy it already done. Yes, it is a little bit more expensive. So you have to put that into your budget, but um Cisco has been very good with us as far as, as getting us local Maine lobster already picked. And Heather, I think my understanding was that um, the sea local seafood does qualify under the uh, local foods funds that you can yes. use. Yeah, it does. Yep. So that's a possibility. Uh, favorite around here is um, lobster mac and cheese. Absolutely. <laughs> um, if I can just share one quick other thing that I forgot. <clears throat> we're working on, we have a value added product Maine Coast Monkfish stew that some schools have served and we've taste tested it around and it was really popular, but it's pretty pricey for schools, but we're working on getting that qualified for the local food purchasing program too. So stay tuned. Hopefully that will happen soon. I'm also trying to twist DOE's arm to ink because fish is a regional product. You know, people can steam out of Portland and land in Gloucester and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it really doesn't make sense to be like putting state lines on fish, which don't follow state lines. Um, so I really want to kind of twist the arm of it's also the only wild food that we're besides like blueberries that we're putting on cafeteria menus. So I really sort of want to twist the arm and have fish be an exception so that, you know, for schools that aren't prepared to do scratch cooking can get the, you know, the local food essentially discount for these value added local fish products like the fish sticks um, that both Bree and Carol mentioned. I think that's a great point. Um, just speaking on behalf of the DOE, Stephanie, Stephanie and I are actually going to talk about this in the coming days. Um, so good we were to just hear. talking about how, um, especially because there isn't processing infrastructure in Maine. So that really does create a barrier. And there are exceptions to that rule with, in other instances with child nutrition, like we can have bananas because nobody grows bananas in the United States. So it's just, you know, on a more micro level. So I, Stay tuned on that as well. That's so, so exciting to hear. Okay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Of course. 
Yeah, I would just say um, down East Maine, we, we do have a lot of salmon farms. So it seems like salmon would be an easy thing to get into the schools as well. Um, and I just wanted to put out there to um, school nutrition staff, one of the intents um, as a heal coordinator, for me anyway, I'm here as technical assistance. If you're doing harvest of the month, the goal is that March is your protein month. And perhaps I would challenge each of you to find a way to incorporate seafood as your protein for this March. After what the fishermen are going through, through these storms, they're going to need all the support they can. Um, wearing red in support of fishermen is a very popular thing to do. And I would be available anytime in February for schools in my uh, down east region to do taste testing with you and would love to get some monkfish if that's a possibility before then. Um, yeah, other comments from school staff. Two minutes, don't be shy. This is your chance to ask any question you want. Did I hear that um, Native Maine um, provides local fish to all accounts? Did I did I hear that right? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so right now um, it's interesting because we have this for product product for profit product, the monkfish stew that they do deliver, but not typically to schools, but they have, and some schools have been able to work it into their budget and they're purchasing it regularly. Um, so that is an option. You can look into pricing and see if that works for you. Right now, they haven't been able to deliver the donated fish because we don't have a way to cover the delivery fee. Um, so we just need to tweak the system essentially so that it's <clears throat> an order that they place um, that functions as like a, a purchase order, but that actually equates to nothing, if that makes any sense. So, so like... It, it should hopefully happen, um, but right now Native is not delivering the donated fish. But you can purchase, they will sell you local right. fish from Harbor, mm. yeah. So yeah. I, I currently use Native Maine with my USDA. I have uh, favors in part of my contract and they've already delivered once. So I was wondering if I could piggyback if I have them coming next month to deliver my produce that I could order, purchase local seafood from them. Yeah, like Susan said that like they're working on the donated fish, but they they do source fish from Harbor Fish down here in Portland. And as long as you're specifying local, then um, they should be able to make that happen. And, you know, um, there are less expensive local fishes. I know Cusk is a, you know, you can get it retail for like five bucks a pound. Um, That's good. So yeah, it's worth asking um, what they'd be able to provide. And there are like, I, I think the first step for everybody who's interested is to talk to your vendors. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I can talk to PFG North Center all day long and be like, look, you guys really need to like provide local fish. I'm not one of their customers, so they're not right. going to listen to me. But if you all collectively or like individually can be like, look, like Dennis, we want local fish. PFG, we want local fish. They're going to listen to their customers. And the more of you who are telling them it, then they're going to start to listen. Um <clears throat> So I think that's a great first step. Um, you know, I went through this process when we were working on the USDA project with the schools in Maine, and um, it's possible. It's doable. We have lots of sources of local fish in the state, um, and it's just putting the pieces together in terms of the vendors and the distribution. Um, but that's something that, you know, we can help work figure out with you, but the very first step is talking to your vendors and seeing what they can provide. And again, the how-to has all of these steps outlined in it. Um, it's helpful to say like, we want a local whitefish like pollock or haddock or hake or whatever, and be really specific um, that you want it to come from the Gulf of Maine. Um, but again, this is all out outlined and um, I think all of us can be good resources. 
Yeah, great. We're going over time here. I'm available to stay another five minutes. I didn't want to cut anyone short if they had important questions because we've got some really um, well-educated people in this field. Super grateful for all of our presenters today. This is really important topic, very timing um, in the situation that our fishermen are in this week. Um, really appreciate it. Please wear red on Wednesday and support your fishermen. And we will send a follow-up email to the attendees so that they can get their um, one hour credit for um, professional development. And I'll stay on with Deb and Kate for just a moment following. Thank you again, presenters. Very grateful for your work. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.